Well, good evening, everyone, wherever you're tuning in from. Over the next hour, we're going to take you from lockdown London to occupied France in the company of the man who brought murder to the Western Isles. On behalf of Aberdeen Performing Arts and all our festival partners, welcome to Granite Noir 2021. I'm Brian Burnett, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this digital staging of Aberdeen's International Crime Writing Festival. Now, if you're a BSL user or someone in your house, this performance is being signed, so just follow the link on the website. And talking of that website, there's a chat box there. Please don't be shy. We would love to get your questions throughout the session and hear from as many of you as we can, and we will leave plenty of time at the end to get through your questions. Now, today's guest, Peter May, has sold over four and a half million novels, and his work has been translated into something like 32 different languages. But last year, he found himself back in the bestseller charts and became the author of the most talked about crime novel of the year. Lockdown was set in London during a global pandemic. The NHS was overwhelmed. We were all told to stay at home and no one was safe from this deadly virus. Is it any wonder that when he wrote it five years ago, publishers said this was ludicrous. No one would ever believe such a thing would happen. He returns with a new book, The Nightgate, which is published next month. And we also see the return of one of his best loved characters, the retired forensic scientist Enzo McLeod, who's persuaded to help solve the vicious murder of a famous art critic. That is linked to a murder that happened 70 years before. And at the centre of it, the most famous work of art of all time, which may hold clues as to why these men were killed. To join us to talk about that and so much more, welcome Peter May. Brilliant to have you here. Lovely to be here, Brian. Hey, where exactly are you joining us from today? I'm in southwest France, um, about two hours north of Toulouse, lying in the middle of nowhere. So, um, yeah, uh, but I'm not speaking French tonight, so uh, nobody has to get out their um, translation of their dictionary and their phrase books and stuff. We may well have some people tuning in from France. I think over the weekend we've had people from around 50 different countries, which is amazing. Let's get into talking about the new novel. You described it as a child of coronavirus. What did you mean by that? Well, because it wasn't the book that I intended to write. Um, I had spent some months uh, at the end of uh, 2019 and into 2020 developing a storyline and doing all the research for a book which was going to be set on the Norwegian uh, archipelago of Svalbard in the Arctic Circle. And I had my research trip all booked up. That was for uh, May last year. Um, and then, of course, along came uh, the coronavirus. Um, and by March, it became clear that I was going to have to cancel that research trip. It was just simply wasn't possible to, to go. And um, I, you know, I never write about a place I haven't been to. So it, I was left in a, a major quandary. What do I do? Um, I had a, I had a, a deadline to make for, you know, with my publisher's contract, and of course, readers were expecting a new book at the uh, early, the early part of um, 2021. So I had to come up with something new, and the Nightgate was the book that um, I came up with. Are you one of these people who always has to be working? <laughs> I guess I probably am. Um, I like uh, to unwind. I like to relax. Um, I, it, the, the danger with that is, of course, that, that relaxation can become addictive and um, you get as addicted to doing nothing as you do to working all the time. Um, but... Uh, by and large, yes. I, I, you know, I, I, I hate to be idle. I like to, I like to be doing something to have a project on the go. You're surrounded by toys at the moment, <laughs> and this wonderfully equipped music studio. Is that not too much of a distraction when you're trying to write a new book? Um, no, I wasn't. You know, I wasn't in here. I don't think I was in here once um, during the writing of the book. 
as I was in my uh, uh, study in the house, which is just across the way behind me. Um, this is an apartment above a double garage, um, <laughs> which I converted into um, a music studio um, to indulge my love of music, which has been with me all my life. Um, uh, it actually turned into a great facility for being able to do promotion um, around the world during lockdown because you know we couldn't travel so um, it's it's been great. In this new book Enzo McLeod one of your best loved characters returns he's he's retired now when you first wrote him you were a struggling author you were trying hard to get published do you write him differently now that you're successful? I don't think so I think um Enzo's the same person that he was when I started writing him. He and I were both around about the same age when I started writing him, and we were both about 50 um, at that point, and um, we we both had ponytails um, <laughs> and uh, were called old hippies by our daughters. Um, and uh, yeah, he, he was a great lover of food and drink, um, which of course is a reflection of my own um, preferences in life. Um, uh, and he's not really changed over the years and um, neither have I. So writing for him is, is just... It's, it's always like um, just getting together with an old friend again. You know, um, you may not have been with them for a while, but it seems like no time has passed at all. It is, is he you then? Because when I read this new book, and it's about someone who, who's been doing this for a long time, maybe an age when you could possibly retire, but there's still that desire to do the thing he loves, and people still want him to do it. And I kind of thought, is this Peter talking about himself here? <laughs> well, yes, there's an element of truth in that. Um, it, he's not entirely me. Uh, he owes a lot of his uh, character and personality to me. But, uh, you know, I think he's much crankier than I am. Um, uh, uh, and um, he's a bit more flirtatious, shall we say, than I am. Um, he, he has a great uh, love of the opposite sex. Um uh, which I do too, but you know, um, uh, it, it's um, no. I, I mean, people over the years have said he's you, isn't he? He's you. Um, he's probably of all the characters I've ever written, he's the closest to me. You obviously hold him close, pretty close to your heart. Do you feel affection towards him? Oh yes. I mean, he, he's um, he's a bit of an idiot. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of lovable idea. He always he always manages to get into uh, you know ridiculous situations and respond in entirely the wrong way, um, which is a bit like myself. Um, uh, but I, in fact, there was a um, there was a critic in in America once described him uh, as as a cross between Inspector Clouseau and James Bond. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which made me laugh a lot. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I, I, I like him a lot, uh, and he's easy to write for. Um, and in in a way, um, I suppose it was the easy option for me when it came to writing this book because I could have created a new character uh, for the Nightgate for the contemporary element of the story, but because it was set in France. Um, and it was going to be set in this part of France where I live, and Enzo mm. uh, lives not far from here in the, the town of Caor. Um, uh, it, it just seemed like he was the obvious person to do it, and it's also it saved me creating a new character, um, which, given that I was under considerable amount of time pressure to write the book, um, was a, a bit of a godsend, really. Tell us a, a, a bit about the storyline. I was going to say a brief bit about the storyline, but that's very hard to do because this is an, an epic tale. It is. Um, I mean, I, th I think you summed it up quite well. There's a contemporary murder of a, of a, a famous French art critic in a, um, a rural French village. In fact, a village just across the valley there. Um, uh, uh, and there's... Uh, it's linked to a murder uh, which took place 70 years earlier, which is um, uncovered, shall we say, by a, a tree which is blown over in a storm and the roots uh, disinter 
this body that's been laying in the earth uh, since the 1940s. Um, uh, and as the investigation into those two apparently separate things uh, get underway, then a link is discovered between them, and that link involves the Mona Lisa. Um, it it was a it was a story which grew out of a blog post that I had done about a year previously. Um, I uh, I subscribed to a, a, a photo blog called Blip Photo. And I'd posted a photograph that I'd taken at a local exhibition in a town hall in a village just along the road. And that exhibition was about <clears throat> the evacuation of the art, the entire collection of art from the Louvre during the war to um, keep it out of German hands and safe from bombing. Um, and uh, the, 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 the art had moved to various chateaus around France. But for the last two years of the war, it ended up right here in this area where I live, uh, most of it in a chateau along the road called Chateau de Montal. Um, and I, you know, so I was looking at this, the Mona Lisa was there as well. And, and they had a, they had staged a mock-up of the Mona Lisa in the, the kind of crate that it was transported in. Um, and that's the, the photograph that I took for the blog. The thing was that as I was looking at all the other photographic exhibits around the exhibition, I suddenly find myself looking at this photograph, an old black and white photograph of a building that I owned. Uh, and it was a double garage with an apartment above it. And it's where I'm sitting right now. And this was used as an overspill for the, some of the art that they couldn't get into the Chateau de Montal. Uh, and where I'm sitting right now, along the length of this room and right along the corridor to the back of the, the apartment, um, huge canvases from the Louvre, which had been taken out of their frames and rolled around long poles for transportation, were laid out here. Um, and the, I mean, these are world famous paintings like um, the Wedding Feast at Cana by Veronese and the, the, the Sacre de Napoleon uh, by, by David. I mean, they were right here. I still feel the spirit of them. You know, I can feel them <laughs> sitting here now. Um, I've searched about the place and they didn't leave anything here, I'm afraid. But um, I wrote about this. Uh, I just thought it was a, 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 an extraordinary coincidence. And, um, and I got an extraordinary response from readers saying, well, that would make a great book. What a fantastic story. <clears throat> and, you know, at the time... I couldn't really see what the story was. I thought it was, it was an interesting uh, piece, but you know, for a narrative, for a novel, I, I, I didn't see it. But when I was scratching around last May, June for an idea, um, I, I returned to that and thought, well, it obviously appealed to people. Let's see if I can fashion a story from this. And bit by bit, the story started uh, putting itself together. Um, and it involved, uh, storylines that take place in two different um, times, one contemporary, the other in uh, 1940s France during the war, um, uh, which involved a huge amount of research, but very interesting and enjoyable research and research I could do from home because I was confined to quarters because of the, the, the lockdown in, in France. Uh, and as far as the contemporary element of the, the story was concerned, most of the action took place in places that I know well anyway. So I didn't have to, you know, travel to, to, to see them. Although I did last summer when restrictions were considerably lighter, I did refresh my memory. I went to revisit Chateau Montal and the Tour Saint Laurent and the, out the village across the, the, the valley there where um, a lot of the action is set, Carinac, which is one of the most um, described as one of the most beautiful villages in France. There is something sweet about that story of a man who's spent a chunk of his life traveling around the world researching his books. And the research for this one has led him back literally to his own out front door. Yes, exactly. I, I mean, it's, there is a sweet irony about it. And, and it, it, it all came to pass just at the right time to provide me with um, a story to write uh, uh, when I was um, kind of incapacitated by the the pandemic. The Mona Lisa, as I said at the start, is at the centre of this. You write, still she stared at him as if she knew why he was here. 
and slowly he felt himself falling under her spell. Even after all these centuries, she still had the power to seduce. What is the appeal of her to writers over the years? I don't know. There's a there's there's quite a mystique, isn't there? I when I first went to see the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, um, th- th- she was hung in this really quite gloomy little corner uh, of the art galleries, um, and and I was initially quite disappointed. It was there was there were huge crowds, and it, you know you couldn't really get near the painting. And and the the first thing that strikes you about it is it's so tiny. It's I mean it's only about this size. I mean it's very very small. Um, uh, and it, it, when you do get close to it, you'll see it's quite deformed by the crackleur. It's called the the varnish and paint that's cracked over all the years. Um, so it, it, it's um. But through that haze, that mist of time, there's this strange smile that emerges from the gloom. <laughs> and it is quite a gloomy picture when you actually see it. Um, it, it and it, I, I, I can't put my finger on it. It, it just, it, it, there is something, you know, it's not just me. It's obviously it has, it has had that effect on people over generations and generations. It's... Um, just an extraordinary work. Among the people who coveted the Mona Lisa, very early into the novel, Hitler appears, and he's desperate to own this work of art. How do you drop Hitler into a book, particularly when almost everyone's got their own idea of what he was like? Was that was that did that make you nervous? I wasn't nervous about it. I was. It was a challenge, um, and and I really enjoyed it. Um, he, I mean, the thing about Hitler was, um, he, in, in terms of the art, he wasn't after um, these paintings for himself. He wanted to create this super museum in Linz in Austria, which was his hometown. Um, uh, and he wanted the best art in the world to be there. He wanted it as a kind of glorification of the whole Nazi ideal. Um, <clears throat> uh, and it, you know, it it was interesting going back, reading about his personal history as a failed painter himself, um, uh, and trying to get a sense of the personality because we all know the monster, um, mm. and, and we all know the in, in a sense the cliche that is Hitler. Um, but it was it was you know who who is who is the person behind that who has this kind of dream of creating a super museum. Why would he want to do that? Um, and so that's why the, 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 the primary scene that I did with him was, was um, at the Berghof, which was his mountain retreat in the Bavarian Alps. Um, uh, and, I, and I was able to get a sense of the atmosphere and, and the, the kind of um, general sense of personableness that there was there. I mean, a kind of bonhomie that existed there, um, mostly from uh, Eva Braun's home movies. I mean, she took, she took a lot of home movies and they're all in color, which kind of takes it away from that black and white uh, time distance thing. Um, and it, so it was interesting to just get to feel all that and, and think about all that. I mean, the other character, of course, was Goering, who's I mean, he's after the painting for himself. He wants it. He's he's a very different character from Hitler, um, and in in a way more interesting to write. Um, I mean, he he, he was um, hugely eccentric. I mean, he he had this uh, huge uh, hunting lodge and estate uh, called Curran Hall, north of Berlin. Um, where he, you know, he had a cinema and a swimming pool and a dental surgery. Um, I mean, this is all at the mm. kind of German taxpayers' expense, of course. Um, and he kept lion cubs. Uh, I mean, just so you couldn't you couldn't make characters like this up. You know, they can only come out of history for real. Um, and it was a challenge to write for these characters, but a joy to do it as well. The thing that runs through almost all your work, it, it's two things. They are very cleverly plotted and they are impeccably researched. How difficult is it to leave the research behind and start creating the fiction? It's, um, it's, it's a process 
whereby one feeds into the other, really. Um, I, I, um, when I start developing an idea, um, usually there's, there's an element of it that is going to require considerable amount of research because I like to make life difficult for myself. And, um, uh, but I enjoy research. I mean, I, I guess that's the thing. I, I do enjoy it. And as I, you know, I learned as a journalist um, how to research anything at a, at a drop of a hat, never be afraid to pick up a phone and ask somebody mm. if they can help you. Um, and so that's always a, a major part of the process for me, the research. And a lot of um, creative ideas come out of the research, things that I wouldn't necessarily have thought of if I hadn't done the research. Um, but at the end of the day, the research is the slave to the story. Um, the story is the most important thing. And the story itself it, it, it won't work unless you have fully fleshed and developed characters so um th th there's a kind of um relationship between character story and research which is um vital to the to the creation of the whole but um as you say uh you know the, there's the, the there may be a concern that you, you know you you put far too much of your research into the story just because you've done it. Mm. Um, but I, I, I don't think, I hope I don't do that. Um, but I do like to create a sense for my readers that uh, I have done my research and that what I'm writing about is founded in fact. Are you still a journalist at heart then? <laughs> I, well, I, I I don't think I really ever was a journalist at heart. I was a kind of accidental journalist. You were um, an award-winning journalist. I, well, yes, I was. Yes, um, but it, it's a strange thing, you know, because uh, you know when I was a teenager, still at school, um, I, I wanted to be a writer. I mean, that's that was the ambition, and I. I I had, you know, you in fifth year or sixth year, you you, you got appointments with um, careers advisory officer in the school um, to discuss your future, what it was you were going to do. And um, I had an appointment. It was a it was a, a lady, um, and she said, "So what is it you want to to do? To do what do you want to be?" I said, "I want to be a writer," and she laughed. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, to to her it was that absurd. I mean. A writer, well, and, it, and of course, in those days, there was there was no career route to becoming a writer. There were no creative writing courses at university. You would, you know, it was. I mean, I had no idea what how I could become a writer except by just writing. Um, and and so I didn't want to go to university, and uh, um, I'd, I'd got expelled from school anyway, um, and um, and I took on kind of crazy jobs working out interest in bank books at the Department of National Savings and selling secondhand cars, writing all the time, uh, but always wondering where on earth I was going, what my direction was. And then I, I discovered by chance an application for a place on a journalist course being run by the NCTJ, which is the National Council for the Training Journalists at a college in Edinburgh. And I, I applied. I thought, here's a way of making a living. Uh, by writing uh, it wasn't the kind of writing that I had envisaged but it was still writing and um, so I applied for that was very fortunate to get one of 12 places out of about 250 applicants um, and spent a, a fantastic year in Edinburgh learning nothing about journalism but playing a lot of table football um, and uh, and then got a job in the Paisley Daily Express and uh, and that was my route into journalism, as I say, an accidental journalist, um, and I was there for eight years, um, and and I enjoyed it, and I enjoy. I learned so much from uh, journalism. I learned how to write quickly, um, how to work to a deadline, um, economy of words, um, you know, how to research, um, all these things that would later become you know uh, very useful tools uh to to the future novelist um uh, but as i say it wasn't it wasn't the career path i'd seen for myself and so um there was that transition then from journalism into uh television when someone tells you you can't do something and in the case of your careers officer laughs at the mere suggestion of it does that make you more determined to succeed at it 
Yes. Um, my uncle, when I was about, um, I don't know what age I was, I must have been about 18. Um, he laid into me one Christmas day um, about what a waster I was and what a disappointment I was to my parents. And I should give up this fantasy of wanting to be a writer. And, uh, you know, and, um, and I, I, it was, it all came out of the blue and I was quite taken aback by it at the time. I think it was, it was prompted by the fact that the previous year I'd run away from home um, with the, the band that I played with and we'd gone off to London and had a kind of crazy adventure. Um, uh, but in a way that kind of, you know, made me kind of put my back up and said, well, I'm going to show you, pal. Um, <laughs> um, and, um, and I did. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it does. I mean, when people say you can't do something, yes, it makes it, it makes you all the more determined to do it. One thing I wanted to ask you about all of this research and, and reading like it, there must be boxes and boxes of it. What do you do with it all when you finish the book? It's in the cellar. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, it, and there literally are boxes and boxes and boxes of it. I have files. I mean, you know, particularly um, my years of doing the, the China Thriller series, I had Oh, I mean, I, I mean, the research that went into that was extraordinary, and I, and I have you know, these file boxes um, in bigger boxes um, and rows and rows of them down in the cell, and all the photographs that I took on my research photography, because I mounted all my photographs on huge uh, sheets of coloured paper. Um, some some of the photographs. This was like this is early technology, isn't it? I mean, it was pre-digital photography it was pre-video uh cameras um or at least not that i could have afforded um uh, and you know so i was taking um you know five shots and stitching them all together to give me a panorama and pasting these up so that i had all these uh, sheets that i could refer to as writing a scene in this a certain street in beijing for example i would get that up and i would pin it up on the wall in front of me and and it would bring it all back. And later, of course, that uh, that changed because everything started to become digital and I got a video camera. So from about the fourth book in the China series on, uh, all my uh, pictorial research was on video and I started experimenting with editing software so that I could just call up locations onto this, the screen that I was writing on and, and look at locations. And it helped to have sound. And I started doing interviews and recording interviews as well. So, you know, the, all, all that kind of stuff it accumulates. Yeah. <laughs> There's probably less paperwork generated in solving an actual crime than there is uh, <laughs> researching crimes for your books. A quick question, talking about your China thrillers. Elizabeth has just sent in a question saying, are you going to write any more of them? No, I'm afraid not. Um, <clears throat> I um, it, 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 That was an accidental series. Um, I, the, the first book in the China thrillers, the, the Firemaker, was only ever supposed to be a standalone. And, um, I, you know, when I was, I, I didn't have a publisher at that time. Um, uh, and I just got myself an agent. And the agent was punting the, the manuscript around various publishers. And one publisher expressed an interest and asked to see me. And I went along. And um, the editor said to me, um, I like this and um, we'd like to offer you a two book contract on uh, the basis that the second book will involve the same characters and the same location, um, which meant that, you know, what had been a standalone book was creeping into a second. And, you know, when I finished that, and, and I, I actually presented them with another idea. They said, no, no, we want more China. And that went on through the entire series. Every year I said, yeah, I've got this great idea. I want to do the series of um, a, a Scottish uh, 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 forensics expert who lives in France called Enzo McLeod. No, 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 no. Give us more China. Um, <laughs> I want to write this book set in the Isle of Lewis. No, 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 no. Give us more China. Um, and I'd written six of them. Uh, and and I had this brilliant idea for the seventh, and um, I, I had a contact who was getting me exclusive access um, to a very remote and uh, difficult part of China, 
and uh, well, in fact, Tibet. Um, and um, I, I, I was really looking forward to this trip and, and the, developing this storyline. And, and I, I took the synopsis to the publisher. Uh, and for the first time in six years, they said, we don't want any more China. Um, and that was the end of the China series. Uh, and um, and it, that was it. They killed it, not me. Um, and it kind of, it kind of, I suppose it was left unresolved as far as the characters were concerned. But it, it's what year is this? Twenty one. It's nearly, it's nearly twenty years Gosh. since since I wrote the last of those books. Um, and I, 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 I couldn't go back to them now. How important is that sense of place to your work? It's very important. I think the the uh, the location in which the the major location in which the book is set uh, is is always like a character to me. It has it because it has its own personality, its own characteristics. Um, it will have its own weather, and weather will always determine the, you know the mood of a story, uh, whether it's a grim, dark, cold winter kind of setting or a bright, hot, sweaty summer setting, um, you know, or, 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 you know, these, mm. these things uh, are very much affect the way you tell a story, the way the, the demeanor of the characters in the, in the narrative um, uh, and, and the place itself, just, they always have a personality. And, and, and I, I think it's very important that to capture that, uh, and so that that sense of place is very real for the reader. Also, you know, as I said, I, I tend not to write about anywhere that I haven't been to. Um, and I think that uh, gives the reader a sense of trust in me that, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm writing with a sense of knowledge about the place where the story is taking place. And I suppose the best example of that is Lewis. I listened to an old Radio Scotland programme this week where they take you back to Lewis and <laughs> yeah, you describe that. it as this place looks like it's been photoshopped by God, which I thought was a, a great line. What kind of hold does Lewis have over you? It's, um, it's, I suppose it's my spiritual home now. Um, it, I mean, I was born and brought up in Glasgow and I didn't, go to the Outer Hebrides uh, until I think the first time was 1990 when I was going up to research the feasibility of, of, of setting a, a Gallic soap opera uh, on the islands um, and um, that was my first visit and it was uh, in, in lots of ways it was a kind of culture shock it was a geographical shock I mean uh, Isle of Lewis is so different in many ways from uh, mainland Scotland. Um, no trees for a start. Um, uh, and that wind uh, and those wonderful coastlines and the, that, the sea that dominates everything and this huge sky, um, you know, it makes an impression on you. The, the first time you go, a huge impression. But I, I then spent most of the next six years, um, well, certainly five to six months a year filming on location, on the islands, in all weathers, um, and uh, getting to know it intimately to the point where I kind of, you know, I, I, I could I could have seen it far enough. Um, you know, when you're trying to film single camera, in, you know, in, in a hailstorm in, in <laughs> the month of June, uh, and you're trying to get the reverse shot and suddenly the sun's shining, you go, no. Um, you know, it, 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 it offered up many frustrations to the filmmaker. Um, and I, at, at, at the time when I when I quit Macha and and quit the world of television, in fact, and left the island for the last time, um, there was almost a sense of relief. But I think that was a sense of relief at at moving on to the next stage of my life, um, which was about devoting my time and my energies to trying to make a living writing books. Um, and it wasn't. It was nearly ten years later that I went back to the islands for the first time. And um, I, I, I had the strangest sensation as I flew into Stornoway uh, on that uh, return trip 10 years on, and all the hair stood up the back of my neck and, and it just felt like coming home. Um, and I just loved it. I just, 
uh, I reveled in it and uh, you know and I, I, there were so many people that I remembered and who remembered me from you know the time filming Maka that was it, it it was special and and then of course I mean having written the trilogy there and a couple of other books with the the island setting um it's just become part of the fabric of my soul in a way um I do love the fact that a novel about two murders, one in contemporary and one in World War II France, you somehow managed to get back to Lewis and the new <laughs> book as well. Tell us uh, why you decided to do that. Um, well, I, the, one of the characters in the book is um, uh, a young French um, art student called Georgette Pignal, um, and she is trapped in London uh, at, the ta- at the point when the Germans invade uh, France and she's not able to get back um, and she is summoned to a meeting with uh, Charles de Gaulle who's in exile in London and uh, you know setting up the whole free French organization um, and um, he charges her with uh, keeping the Mona Lisa out of the hands of the Germans because they have this intelligence that Hitler's after it and um, uh, so you know they're going to drop her uh, into France, uh, but they put her through some basic training first. And um, and I'd, I'd heard stories when I was on Lewis about uh, the fact that the Lewis Castle, which um, overlooks the inner harbour and stored away and looks out over the whole town, uh, had been used in that kind of capacity at uh, some point during the war. And I thought, well, Here's a here's a great opportunity to go back, and it it just it's a big change from you know wartime Paris um, and contemporary rural France. Um, you know, let's throw in a bit of the Outer Hebrides, um, and so that section of the the book where she travels to the Isle of Lewis for the first time and spends um, a week uh, training with the SOE uh, at the castle. Keep your questions coming in, by the way. Uh, you can find the chat window underneath the video screen on the website. One of the questions that has come in here asking about your books being made into a film, but what, why have there never been any big TV adaptations of these books, do you think? Um, largely because I've resisted um, uh, going down that road. Um, I did at one point sign a contract with the BBC for a dramatisation of The Black House uh, with the potential to go on and do the whole uh, trilogy. Um, But very quickly I became aware of the direction that they were wanting to take it in and I didn't like it. Mm. Um, And so I I told my agent to get me out of it. And so we managed to get out the contract and I I, I killed it. And I, I, I kind of... I mean, it would be nice to see, you know, a really quality adaptation of something like the Lewis trilogy. But, um, you know, there are so many bad adaptations out there. You know, I, I wouldn't <laughs> want to see a bad one. Um, I'd rather the books stood in their own right and uh, spoke for themselves, if you like. Um, I, I, I think if I was a director, it would be a nightmare trying to adapt books that were written by a former TV producer. <laughs> well, I, I think um, there, there was something of that because, uh, you know, after I'd signed this contract and, they, you know, in, in the in the pre-contract discussions, they'd said, of course, you know, you can be an executive producer on this. Uh, and I thought, fine. I know that doesn't mean a huge amount in terms of hands-on, but um, uh, when we'd done the contract and we then came around to discussing the executive producer position, they said, no, we don't want you to be executive producer. Uh, and I said, why not? And they said, well, we think it will put off the calibre of writer that we want to do the adaptation. Uh, <laughs> which, uh, well, you can imagine what my reaction was. There were two words which immediately sprang to mind. Um, <laughs> uh, and, um, and that prompted... <laughs> <laughs> to a large extent, my decision to to put an end to it. Um, let's but, talk. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I mean, on you go. <laughs> let's do, let's let's move to something else because I need to get this. And we want to talk about Peter May clairvoyant and <laughs> lockdown. And um, it's not the first time you've predicted events in the future. But how weird was the whole experience 
of having written a pandemic novel and then finding it published last year? It was very weird. Um, and it came totally out of left field. I, I simply wasn't expecting it or thinking about it. When I wrote that book in 2005, so like 15 years previously, <clears throat> and um, it, it had gone through the process of being offered to publishers and it had been knocked back. It was unrealistic. It didn't, it was more um, science fiction than crime genre, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, you know, it, it it was all water under the bridge to me that, that, that it had come and it had gone, it had been left somewhere in the, the, the dusty mists of history. And I'd moved on. I'd written, I don't know, 10, 12, 14 books since then. Um, uh, and uh, literally forgotten about it. I mean, I guess somewhere in the back of my mind, I remembered that I'd done it and I remembered roughly what the story was, but the detail of it had completely gone. Uh, but I wasn't thinking about it at all when the, coronavirus arrived and we started going into lockdown it was frankly not in my mind at all it wasn't anywhere on the horizon as far as I was concerned I was I was just concerned like everybody else was about staying safe about you know not catching the virus at, um, and you know the, the the trauma of lockdown and how it was going to affect all our lives and um, and it was somebody on my Twitter timeline who suggested that I might like to think about writing a book set against the backdrop of the coronavirus pandemic. And, I, and suddenly I went, ching, wait a minute, I've done that already. <laughs> uh, um, well, it wasn't coronavirus in the, in the book, it's bird flu, but it, you know, and, and it, that, that, it just hadn't occurred to me, but, it, you know, that, that, that bell having gone off in my head, I, I, I dug the manuscript out and I reread it which I hadn't done for 15 years. So it was, it, I, I was coming to it very fresh and I had all the detail I'd just completely forgotten, wiped, um, but was absolutely astonished at how much of it reflected what was happening in our lives right there and then. Um, and was quite shocked by that. Um, and I mentioned just by, you know, chance, to my editor at the end of a, a, an email on another subject that I had this manuscript about um, a pandemic <laughs> um, that was unpublished and uh, he, he, he wanted to see it immediately. Um, and I sent him a PDF and he read it overnight and came back to me first thing the next morning and said, this is brilliant, we have to publish it now. Uh, uh, and I was quite startled by that. Um, were you better prepared for the pandemic than the rest of us? Because you'd effectively done the research into what it would mean. I mean, I, yes, in, in lots of ways I felt I was. I, I, I think I was. I would probably have been better placed in government than some of the government ministers who handled the pandemic uh, at the beginning last year because, you know, they just didn't seem to see or understand what was happening and what was coming. Um, uh, and I knew, I absolutely knew what was coming. And it was like watching this slow motion tsunami uh, coming from the Far East. Uh, and everybody, in a way, could see it coming, but everybody was in denial about it until mm. it washed up on our shores. And I was screaming, <laughs> I was screaming at the television nightly um, about what they should be doing. Now, do this now. You have to shut this down. You have to... And they were, you know, having race meetings at Cheltenham and um, football matches were going ahead with full-size crowds. And and it just seemed like such madness to me. And, of course, I mean, all this stuff about wearing masks and washing your hands and all that stuff. I mean, I'd learned that years ago. And um, uh, my, my, my daughter calls me Howard Hughes. You know, I, 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 I mean, I always carried... Um, disinfectant stuff about with me and go on an airplane and uh, wipe down the, the the food tray in front of me Gosh. with a disinfectant wipe on the arms of the chair because I knew that if the person who'd been in that before me had the flu or something else um, I was going to pick it up I was going to get it because all those viruses were going to be on those surfaces um, you know so yes I was very much aware of, of what it all meant at Lynn Halliday's just asked, was lockdown the original title for the novel? 
No, it wasn't. Um, the, it, it only ever had a working title because it had never got to the publication stage. And the working title had been, I think it was called uh, Dying with Angels. Um, uh, Lockdown was the title decided upon for publication. In the new novel, The Night K, instead of sipping coffees, people are slipping on face masks. Coronavirus is just just part of life. What do you think will be the literary response to these times that we're living in? Well, I think it's it's interesting. I, I know quite a lot of writers have, you know, who've been writing during this period have avoided writing about it. I think possibly because they're afraid that people are just sick of it, uh, which of course they are. Um, but I, I, it seemed to me that if you're going to, if you have a contemporary setting, you have to reflect the world as it is, the world we live in. Um, I think people identify with things, whether they're good or bad. But if this is a common experience, people find a certain degree of comfort in that. Um, and so it seemed to me important that I include those daily things that we now take for granted as a part of a way of life, that, that I should include these as part of the normal course of uh, events during the narrative. I want to talk about Scotland. There are a couple of questions coming in, people asking, are you planning to set any more books in Scotland? Will you ever move back here? And in researching your life for this session, uh, I kind of realised there were more profiles written about you in the French press than there were and the Scottish press, and you've won lots of awards and acclaim in France. What's your relationship with Scotland now? Would you say it's um, it's a it's a funny one, that isn't it? Um, I mean, I still I still feel very profoundly uh, Scottish and proudly Scottish, um, uh, and I will always want to go back. Um, whether I would want to go and live in Scotland again, uh, I don't know. Um, I think it's I think it's probably unlikely. I've got used to better weather. Um, <laughs> the wine is cheaper. Um, uh, so, I, and of course, I'm now a French national. I mean, I, I'm naturalised French. Um, uh, so I remain, uh, fortunately, a member of the European Union. I'm a European citizen, um, which I would have lost had I um, continued to live in Scotland, sadly. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, the French call me, um, well, they used to call me um, the most, uh, the most Scottish of French writers, and they now call me the most French of Scottish writers. Or was it the other way around? It's the other way around. The most, it, yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it's Franco Ecosse they call me now. Let's rattle through some of these questions that are coming in now, Peter. We were talking about your impeccable research earlier. Billy said, have you ever made a big mistake in any of your stories, an anomaly regarding the characters or history? Not that I know of, although, you know, in saying that, somebody will probably leap out of the woodwork and point out, um, I mean, I have made little mistakes. I've got um, minor things wrong here and there and people are very quick to point them out and I'm always very uh, keen to get anything that I did get wrong fixed for later editions but nothing major nothing not as far as I'm aware um, I, I kind of tend to pride myself on trying to get these things right I think that's clear when you when you look at the books and look at the research that goes into them. Louise Colvin said, do you think in crime writing, the character driven approach or plot driven approach is most important to you? Character driven. Um, I think you can you could come up with the cleverest uh, plot in the world. Uh, uh, and it could leave readers cold unless they are engaged by the characters. The characters are what bring the story to life. And so first and foremost, you have to devote your time and energy to fully developing and rounding your characters in order to make them the narrative live. A couple of people asking, will we see more books set in Scotland? Is, is the old country still inspiring for you? It's, the, the simple answer is I don't know. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I have no idea what I'm going to do next. We're still 
we're still in the grips of this horrible pandemic. Um, I, I, I don't know if we come out of it um, in the near future. Will I return to my Svalbard idea and, and take that trip that I had to cancel last year? Um, uh, that, that Although the setting is Svalbard, um, the two principal characters are Scottish um, and reappear from uh, an earlier book. I'll not say what that is, but um, uh, so I was, I, I mean, I'd been looking forward to doing that. Um, but as to whether I'll, I'll, I'll use Scotland as a setting, I just, I just don't know. Um, maybe if I get the right idea, yes. Uh, Pat's been in touch. She's from Lewis and Aberdeen. She said, when you were in school, what did you think being a writer would be like? You know, when you talk to that career teacher about you want to be a writer and is the reality different? And she also wants to say, by the way, she loves the authenticity of those Lewis novels. Um, well, <clears throat> it it's... I mean, you don't. You have no idea when you're a kid what you know what the reality of it's like. I mean, I mean, I'd already as a teenager, I had written two books by that time. Not that I ever got them published, but it was part of that learning process. Um, and I just knew that I loved being lost in the story, um, living uh, that that life vicariously through the characters that I'm writing about. It just, you know, would take me out of my reality and into my fiction. And I loved that feeling and just knew that I wanted to do that. The reality of, of course, of trying to make a living as a, a writer of novels is <laughs> entirely different. You know, it sounds very glamorous, but, you know, um, it's very, very hard to make a living at it. And there are a, a very fortunate few of us who are able to do that. Um, but, and for a long time, I was not one of them. I mean, I, 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 at the time I was writing The Black House and the first of the Enzo books and lockdown, um, I was really toiling. I mean, financially, I, I'd gone two and a half years without earning anything um, and my savings dwindling and we were considering selling the house and downsizing and all sorts of things. Um, you know, so uh, it, there, there's nothing very romantic about it. <laughs> Is there now, though? Is life very different now? And do you still, when people say to you, what do you do? And you say, I'm a writer, I'm a novelist. Is that, is that a thrill for you still? Um, I don't know. It's a, we used to say, um, you know, if you were at parties and people would say to you, what is it you do? And you'd say, I'm a writer. They'd say, oh, I'm writing a book. And then spend the next half hour telling you what it is they're <laughs> writing about. Um, so I got into the habit of saying, you know, when people said, what do you do? I'd say, I'm a plumber. Well, you know, they didn't want to talk to you about toilets and, you know, um, block drains. Uh, so that was great. Um, so I, I never, I, I, I kind of shy away from saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a writer. Um, I, <laughs> so I did that school that expelled you all those years ago, know what you went on to do? And did they ever invite you back? They did. Um, I was there, was it last year or the year before? Um, I was invited back and I gave a talk to the, the, um, the, the students. Uh, the headmaster was very keen that I shouldn't mention the fact that I'd been expelled. Um, uh, but the 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 library, the people at the school library, set up um, uh, a literary competition among the pupils um, uh, and gave a, a prize for you know I, I was to judge what the, the the stories that they wrote and and um, there was a prize given at the end of it. Um, so so yeah, I, I'm I'm I kind of it's ironic you know the school that expelled you ends up. Um, listing you as one of their famous former pupils. You, know. <laughs> <laughs> you are just a couple of weeks away from publication of a brand new novel, you know, and, and you've had thousands of reviews over the years. Does it still make you a bit anxious waiting to see what critics and, and readers make of a new book? You're, you're always anxious, yes. I mean, it, it doesn't matter how many times you've done it. In fact, probably... The more often that you write a book, the the, the more you 
you believe that this time you're going to get found out. Um, uh, it, it's, yeah, it's a, it, it's a hard thing always letting go because, you know, then uh, people are going to read it and judgments are going to be made and um, those judgments aren't necessarily always favourable um, and uh, criticism, you know, uh, even well-meant criticism is is kind of hard to take. Uh, you know, when you've it's been writing a book, you're you're it's such an immersive process. You're you're totally absorbed by it for for such a long period of time that um, you know you have an incredible sense of ownership. It's like like having a child. You know, and and if people criticize your child, you get very defensive. So it's um, yeah. Uh, you're always scared of, of letting go. You've had so much acclaim over the years, and there's been lots of awards. The one that intrigued me was the one that was voted for by French prisoners, <laughs> which, which seems an extraordinary award. Did that matter more? Was it more rewarding? Because these are people who, who clearly know crime inside out. Yeah. Well, it was a it was a very weird thing. There was a, um, a festival, a, a crime writing festival at um, Cognac, which is a nice place to go because they fill you full of uh, brandy. <laughs> um, uh, and they they had this um, literary prize called the Prix Intramuros, which is literally the prize behind the walls. Um, and I was told that I had been shortlisted for this along with six other writers who were all French. Um, and that we were all to turn up at Cognac the day before the start of the festival. I had no idea why. Um, we were told that uh, in order for us to continue to um, remain on the shortlist, we had to go and uh, visit the, these prisons in the in the northwest mm. of France, the penitentiaries. Um, and I was given a car and a driver and taken round umpteen prisons and I had to go and talk to the prisoners. Um, and they had been, you know, I think it was librarians had created the shortlist of books and that shortlist had been given to reading groups within the prisons, male and female. And um, and they had all read the books and then they had made their choices. Um, uh, so it was an interesting experience going around talking to these prisoners. I've, I've now been in many French prisons um, as a visitor, I hasten to add. Um, uh, but it was it, it, it felt a little bit extra special to win, uh, you know, an award that had been de decided by criminals. Um, you know, that, that, that had to be some kind of accolade, I guess. And were you, as always, gathering information when you were there, gathering research, gathering ideas for the next book? Oh, well, you always do, yeah. Um, but but then, you know, you want to do the specific research, and I'd, I'd gone to other prisons later for sp specific research. But these things get feed the imagination, and they get they, they give you atmosphere, and they, 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 they put you in touch with a kind of reality that you might not otherwise ever have any contact with. You know, as, as a journalist... It's the same thing. You, you experience uh, facets of life that you would never otherwise experience. Um, uh, and that's what was so great, I think, of, about being a journalist for uh, eventually becoming a writer of novels. And to finish with, can you ever see a day when you're not doing this? Yeah, right now I'm not doing it. Um, I maybe I'll never do it again. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I've got my little recording studio here. I'm indulging my uh, musical fantasies. I can be a, I can be an elderly rock star in my own living room. Um, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, other people get to retire. Why shouldn't writers get to retire? Yeah. But everybody says, you can't retire. You're, you're a writer. Um, somehow we are exempt from retirement. Well, that's what Purenzo thought as well. And, and he's been brought back into action for this new book. Peter, thanks so much for talking to us. Thank you also to Leslie Crerart, who was our BSL interpreter. Interpreter, The Night Gate is published on the 18th of March. Waterstones are our official book supplier for Granite Noir, so you can visit their website and pre-order a copy or follow 
the links coming up next on Granite Roy. What a finale. Lee Randall talks to the global sensation, David Baldacci. In the meantime, Peter, thank you so much for joining us this Sunday night and being part of Granite Noir. My very great pleasure, Brian. Thank you so much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday night.